Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkash. For Turkey, it was a question of sovereignty. For many across the Muslim world, it was a welcome move. For some European countries, Turkey's decision to turn the Hagia Sophia back into a mosque has reopened historical wounds that date back centuries. Having been a museum for 85 years, the UNESCO World Heritage Site will now allow worshippers to pray while also remaining open to all visitors. But those assurances haven't been enough for some. Haider Abbasi explains. An historic day for an historic building. This is the first prayer service in the Hagia Sophia for 85 years. Perhaps the greatest symbol of Turkey's Ottoman past brought back to life. Among the worshippers, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. On the 10th of July, Erdogan announced that the Hagia Sophia's status as a mosque will be restored after a court annulled the 1934 ruling that made it a museum. I'm very moved. The fact that the Hagia Sophia is leaving its status as a museum and becoming a mosque again makes us Muslims extremely happy. But not everyone's pleased. Although many in Turkey and abroad have welcomed the change, there has been criticism. The Hagia Sophia is sacred ground for more than one faith. Christian leaders are especially concerned. Mi pensiero... Istanbul. Penso the Hagia Sophia was built nearly 1,500 years ago as a cathedral. But after being captured by the Ottoman Sultan, Mehmed II, it was converted into a mosque. When Constantinople was captured by the Ottomans in the 15th century, the Hagia Sophia wasn't just a cathedral. It was also the political and cultural center of the capital of the Byzantine Empire. So when it was converted into a mosque, it wasn't just a religious move, but also one with great political significance and symbolism. The founder of modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, withdrew Hagia Sophia's status as a mosque and made it into a museum. But a Turkish court has now ruled that this was illegal. Turkey's leaders have rejected the criticism over the decision. They insist that non-Muslims and foreign tourists will still be able to visit the ancient site. The Hagia Sophia is Turkey's most popular tourist site, attracting nearly 4 million visitors last year. Will this change now that the museum is again a mosque? Heyda Abbasi, Straight Talk, Istanbul. And joining me now is Vehbi Baysan, who is an assistant professor at Ibn Haldun University and Ali Hussein Oğlu, who is an assistant professor at Trakya University's Balkan Research Institute in Edirne. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. So Ali, how significant is the reversion of the Hagia Sophia into a mosque, both for the Muslim and the Christian world? This is an iconic monument, especially uh, because now I am in Greece and I can uh, follow the reactions uh, from uh, this part of the agency. I can I can see that uh, there are uh, there were uh, quite uh, robust reactions uh, from the very highest political figures from other politicians of Greek politics and uh, from some other countries. But uh, Greece was, I think, is one of the the uh, the most reactive uh, countries all over the world about uh, this change. Um, 
I think the reason why is that what will happen uh, is a bit ambiguous uh, for many people. Uh, what, uh, how this change will exactly take place, uh, that's, that's the reason why uh, many people, they just, uh, um, they are quite open to show their concern uh, about this uh, holy monument. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Vepi, Ali said, I mean, there is this ambiguity, uh, as I understand, among the Greeks. So why is this international outcry since the Hagia Sophia uh, will be revered into a mosque, but the president said it will be open to all Muslims, non-Muslims, and foreign visitors. So there's not much of a change, but why are they so stressed about it? Well, it is um, a, a symbolic move. First of all, uh, those who are over 60 years old uh, in, in Turkey, since 1970, uh, opening uh, Hagia Sophia as a mosque or turning back uh, as, as a mosque was a political uh, what they call it is something that a, a dream to actualize, and this is what happened now. So that's how it signifies. And, and on the other hand, uh, in my personal opinion, what makes monumental buildings uh, so valuable is uh, their function. Let's remember in 1453, when um, uh, Sultan Mehmed II, or known as Fatih Sultan Mehmed, uh, took Istanbul. He converted Hagia Sophia and many monasteries into mosques. I think it's a symbolic act. They were not short in finances or resources to build their own mosques. But this was to protect such a, a, a valuable buildings and, and continue its, their function as well. So in 1934, when it turned into a, a museum, it was an act for, you know, at that time in 1930s. But now, when it's back to, uh, for, uh, for again, a, a, a place people would worship, again, you don't have to pay money entering, and then you can go in and worship but outside uh, or, or even visit outside uh, prayer time. So it is, I think, it's not being understood uh, very well in the international community, and I think that's why it's ambiguous in their mind. They don't know what happens. First, they said this was a political act, that it's just uh, testing the international reactions, but then, hey, the court decided, and within hours, the president signed the decree. So it just just happened. So uh, I think if they sit down and think about it, uh, reassigning its original function as a place for worship, it's not a bad idea. Mm. So, um, Ali, will this latest decision set a precedent for other iconic monuments or um, sites across Europe? Do you expect uh, some sort of retaliations from European countries? Uh, in terms of retaliation, uh, I don't think so. That uh, there may be some problems about, uh, for example, restoration of uh, some Ottoman cultural heritage sites, especially across the Balkan Peninsula. Uh, for example, there was a, a kind of uh, opinion given that let's stop some restoration works of uh, some Ottoman cultural site, for example, uh, in Greece. Uh, as a kind of reaction, uh, what has been happening regarding uh, Hagia Sophia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in terms of exact retaliation, I don't think so. Uh, but the, this may cause uh, some problems about restoration of mosques or functioning of so. Mm -hmm. of some mosques uh, in different parts of Europe. And uh, this may also trigger uh, the concept of uh, the, the, the growing uh, concept of Islamophobia uh, across Europe. Yeah, yeah well, Vepi, what kind of an impact do you think this decision will have on Muslims in Europe, which is, we already know, is gripped uh, by a xenophobic environment? Well, I hope no reaction, uh, because then this uh, further proves that actually there is no respect for uh, people worshiping and they don't distinguish between politics and, in fact, the uh, religion. If a uh, uh, European Union is a Christian camp, a Christian uh, lobbying mm -hmm. and disrespect in other faith, then um, why are you complaining about uh, uh, Hagia Sophia? So it doesn't make sense uh, for, for universality or rather in the civilized world. That's what the Greek president said. This was the big blow to the civilized world. 
I mean, I think we shouldn't make, they shouldn't make this kind of uh, claims. Look at in Istanbul, I know there are many, where I'm living now, especially in the historic Istanbul, many churches and synagogues had been uh, really very well restored. The restoration process finished, although we don't have this many Christians to go worship there. It's a yes. symbolic act, I think. They should be grateful that all these monuments have been protected so far. And there are like Tariya Museum, as well as Zeyrek Mosque. And so turning them into mosques, preserve them. And we have unique examples from Eastern Roman Empire this way. Yes. So Ali agrees with which Turkey has strained, rela strained relations lately, has strongly condemned the decision. Could you talk to us about the uh, religious freedoms in Greece, but especially in Western uh, Thrace, uh, where the Muslims live. Yes. Uh, looking from the peace treaty of Lausanne of 1923, as of this day, as of uh, because we are closing uh, 100 years of the signing of the peace treaty of Lausanne, this is very significant because the Muslim Turks living in, in Western Thrace, they attained the official status of minority and their rights, they are under the protection of an international treaty, which is the Lausanne. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are, I mean, looking uh, back uh, 80 years, I can see that, uh, yes, uh, there are some problems. They have already been resolved between the minority and the Greek state. But there are many more that still await uh, getting resolved uh, by Greece, by the Greek state. Uh, for example... Uh, Muslim Turks uh, living in Western Thrace, they cannot define their own religious leaders. Yes, uh, yes, the, the Greek government the, the, appoints people, them. Yes, yes instead these people, of they elections. are appointed uh, yeah, by, the, by the Greek state. Similarly, with, with the same token, uh, the, the members of the Aukaf, which is the religious charitable foundations, which are located in three sub-regions of Western Thrace, uh, they cannot uh, be defined as well, even if there is a law there. Yes. And uh, from time to time, you can see Islamophobic uh, physical or verbal attacks in different parts of Western trace. But All right. Let, yeah, but just because Muslims in Greece is not just uh, the Muslim Turks in Western trace. There are also Muslims uh, in Athens, Thess Thessaloniki, and the Rhodos and Coast Islands in the Dodecanese, which are really mm -hmm. close. Uh, as a region to Turkey, uh, they have different problems. They have some similar problems. But for example, uh, there is a mosque problem uh, in Athens that have not been resolved yes. uh, since 2006. Uh, in my opinion, it's much more significant that they don't have even a Muslim cemetery. Can you imagine that in a capital city where around uh, half a million Muslims approximately, I mean, uh, leave and they don't have a single All right. uh, place cemetery. for funerals. Yeah, cemetery. Okay. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. Thank you. Thanks. It started off with a series of mysterious disappearances. Asylum seekers suddenly vanishing after arriving on Greek shores in the Aegean Sea. Long a busy route for refugees fleeing from Syria, the flow of people shut up at the start of the year after Turkey said it would no longer prevent them from crossing into Europe. Since then, boats have sailed to Greek islands, but once arriving, many asylum seekers met a different fate.
And joining me now from Izmir is Başak Yavcan, a senior researcher at the Yugo Observatory. She is also an associate professor of political science at Tob University in Ankara. And Hannah Berians, who is the director of Migration Policy Institute Europe, a think tank based in Brussels. So ladies, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Başak, a new report released by the European Asylum Support Office revealed that the refugee arrivals from Turkey to Europe decreased almost like 95% since the signing of the refugee deal back in 2016. What has changed? What is the situation in your opinion? Well, um, the number of um, arrivals into EU territories from Turkey has uh, decreased dramatically since signing of the uh, EU-Turkey deal in 2016. Uh, however, the pragmatic cooperation should not be taken for granted, and we've seen that um, after the escalation of the conflict in Idlib in, throughout January and February, especially in late February, uh, Turkey was threatened with a mass influx of Syrians, uh, and Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has announced that Turkey would stop controlling outflows from its western borders, and that sparked the crisis with the EU. As a result, an estimated uh, 12,000 to 25,000 refugees uh, from 20 29 different countries actually have arrived uh, into um, the border with Greece. Uh, and Greece uh, responded by closing its borders with strong operational and political support from the EU and temporarily suspended asylum applications. In addition to suspending asylum applications for a year, uh, the office uh, responsible for uh, processing the asylum applications has said um, between March 13th and May 15th to protect against uh, the spread of yes. COVID-19 mm. that they would suspend. Okay. So, throughout this period, um, the numbers were down again, but uh, because of the accumulation throughout this period and lack of uh, as processing asylum, which, by the way, is uh, an international obligation of Greece. Oh, all right. Uh, Anna, there are also several reports that some boats carrying asylum seekers have started vanishing after arriving on Greek islands while others are being illegally pushed back to Turkey. Can we confirm this? Yes, there have been uh, multiple reports from media and NGOs. Um, so there's been also, um, for example, a group of investigators, including the German uh, newspaper Der Spiegel, that have actually started to forensically analyze these videos to test the veracity of these videos. And indeed, there were reports saying that on the one hand, there's um, a delaying of rescue, so ignoring calls for help. Uh, there are um, uh, reports of shots being fired at migrants trying to attempt to reach um, the border, and there's also been reports of boats being dragged back into um, Turkish waters as a result of that. And so, as a result of this, um, both UNHCR and uh, already the 12th of June has urged the Greek authorities to investigate these multiple reports. And then next to that, on the 6th of July, members of the European Parliament have also asked the Greek government to clarify its position on these reports of pushbacks at the sea and land borders. They have dismissed it as fake news. Yes. But as a result, the European Parliament has asked the Commission to actually investigate this and to impose sanctions if these breaches are confirmed. Yeah, those uh, tragic pictures actually brings to mind the question of the future of the Turkey-EU deal. We know that it's been four years since Brussels signed this deal with Turkey, Ankara, but many argue that the EU hasn't lived up to its uh, promises. Let's just take a look back what was agreed to. As part of the deal, the, the European Union agreed to pay Turkey 6 billion euros in financial aid, 
Four years on, Ankara insists it has yet to receive that amount in full, a claim the European Commission denies. Meanwhile, Greece has so far failed to process asylum applications for Syrian refugees as part of the deal. This backlog has resulted in more than 20,000 refugees being stranded in ill-equipped camps of Greek islands. To complicate the matter, some EU member states have also refused to accept the number of refugees assigned to them under the Turkey EU deal. This year, the EU finally heeded Turkey's call for more financial assistance, but Ankara says supporting its population of 4 million refugees has cost six times the initial 6 billion agreed into the deal. So, Bashak. Will this EU's revised aid package suffice this time around? What do you make of because it is it, going to expire within a year? What is your take on that? Well, um, the conditions of refugees uh, have uh, been grossly affected, of course, by this pandemic uh, because they lay at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder and uh, already the existing research surveys uh, conducted across Turkey indicate 70 percent of the um, refugees have lost their jobs uh, even in, if they were informal and uh, many are facing difficulties in uh, accessing basic services uh, food necessities, meeting their food necessities, uh, access into healthcare services even sometimes. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is really important to revamp this deal and uh, continue collaboration in this area. Mm. Uh, yes, the European Commission on the other hand says it's, it may now propose a new system to monitor uh, the uh, illegal pushback of migrants. So, Hannah, do you believe there is an appetite within the European Union uh, to reform or fix its uh, asylum system? Yes, indeed. Eva Johansson has said that it, she wants to put forward a mechanism to better monitor and verify pushbacks at the EU borders, not only in Greece, but there are reports in other parts of the EU where this is happening. But for the moment, they don't have a mandate to do that. And if you also look at what happened back in March, um, when, of course, there was the, the, the conflict at the border. At the time, there were two main ingredients in the discourse of the EU, which was uh, we will not negotiate with a knife at our throat, we will not be blackmailed, and we need to protect our external borders because um, the EU is not keen to see uh, an increase in, in, in a, a startup of large arrivals again. They are struggling um, to come to an agreement at the EU level, at the EU level, so internally, to agree on a new kind of pact on migration and asylum, which would reform the common European can asylum they, can system. Can they do it without Turkey's cooperation? Well, the, the internal front needs to be tackled by EU member states and the EU government, where, of course, the EU-Turkey deal played an important role in that is by, as uh, our colleague just said, is by lowering the numbers of arrivals so that the member states um, could actually focus on that. So far, after five years of negotiations, that reform hasn't happened. So, uh, Boshak, what are Turkey's options and amid the coronavirus outbreak and the already strange relations between the two sides, how do you think the future of the refugee deal and the refugee crisis would, like, would look like? I think, I think both parties have benefited from this deal so far, and that's why it has been um serving uh, all this time and that's why shortly after the crisis broke both parties have reiterated their commitments to uh, the deal uh, but uh, of course there are criticisms on both sides and uh, there are certain areas that need to be addressed um, and with, with the pandemic one can easily say the basic um, needs of the refugees are of utmost importance at the moment and they should be uh, these the support for those should continue through uh, ESSN support uh, through Fritz uh, in the new deal but also a big area of um, challenge for Turkey is um, self creating self-sustaining mechanisms sustainable mechanisms for refugees and that is only possible through integration in the formal labor market and that should also be supported uh, by the eu through a system uh, which grants certain trade subsidies to turkey uh, mm -hmm. making uh, with uh, goods 
uh, that are heavily produced by refugees uh, more accessible to the EU market, like one uh, signed with uh, Jordan through Compact Jordan. And the grounds for this actually exist uh, in the uh, Global for Compact for Refugees, which does uh, urge countries to support these kind of mechanisms, to explore these kind of mechanisms. Yeah. All right, ladies, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. Appreciate it a lot. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Subarkash. If you've got any comments, do share them with us on Twitter with the hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.